the second day of the Lattices uh, Theory to Practice uh, workshop. Um, so uh, we, have, uh, we have four wonderful talks today. Um, and, uh, and let me sort of first uh, sort of say a few things uh, for those of you who were not here yesterday. Um, uh, you, can, um, uh, you can ask uh, questions via the Q&A interface that you see at the bottom of your uh, bottom top, depending on uh, which computer you're using of your um, Zoom screen. Um, and, uh, and the session chair will, uh, you know, um, uh, will work with the uh, speaker to sort of get these questions answered um, uh, either right away or uh, at the end of the talk, uh, you know, depending on what is most appropriate. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, so, 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 uh, so welcome to everyone. In case the Zoom gets disconnected, hopefully it won't happen. I want to remind everyone that, uh, that the talk is live streamed on YouTube from the Simons Institute webpage. So if you go to the workshop webpage, you can see a, sort of a, you, you can sort of stream it on YouTube. Um, uh, is there anything else that, uh, that I wanted to say? Um, that's, uh, that's about it. So I'll hand over to Vadim who will um, lead the way. Okay, uh, okay thanks, Vinod. So I guess I will just hand it off to Leo who is a researcher at uh, CWI. And he'll talk about uh, side channel attacks on lattices. So thanks, Leo. Go ahead. Thank you, Vadim. Um, so before uh, I go into the technical talk, uh, I would like uh, to share uh, with you the, the political victory of the day in France. So um, there was the fear that the French government would pass a law to uh, enact uh, tracing, uh, COVID tracing app, and that it would pass this law as a package with uh, all, all uh, many other measures, uh, which would have been a kind of a denial of democracy. This is a, a topic that deserves debate, democratic debate. Fortunately, this uh, did not happen, and this is uh, maybe because of uh, the actions and the political involvement of many French cryptographers that includes uh, not limited to uh, Anne Canto, Damien Stelle, and Olivier Blasi. So I really want to thank them for having been active uh, on this topic so that we have a proper democratic debate. Uh, I also want to invite you to uh, all be involved politically on this topic and not just technically. Um, and for this, it means that you have to think not only as a scientist, but also uh, as a citizen. And in particular, as scientists, we can have uh, two kinds of biases. Uh, either, you know, we do, we're doing cryptography, we, privacy is very important, and privacy of medical data is very important. Therefore, we must not touch at it, despite uh, other uh, pot potential beneficial aspect. So I think we have to speak about privacy, uh, but we have to be aware that it is a trade-off between privacy and you know, other matters. And we can speak on privacy, but it doesn't mean that we have alone the knowledge to decide what is the best trade-off. Uh, but there's also the other bias, uh, the technical bias. Maybe we can be very excited to see cryptography being deployed to uh, get us out of this crazy crisis. Um, yeah, be careful about this because, again, you you will you will lose your uh, objectivity, and you might you know define a model and define what uh, anonymity means and prove that your protocol is anonymous, when there is still kind of a lot of different kinds of attack that still break this anonymity. So be careful about your own bias and please be politically active. Uh, contact your uh, local politicians. Um, you know, watch what is going on, keep informed about what is going on and try to inform the general public using your knowledge and only your knowledge. Uh, with all this said, uh, let's uh, go to the technical talk. Let's talk about lattices and enjoy a little bit of mathematics. This is purely academics, no more politics, I promised. Uh, so yes, my talk is about uh, it's not exactly about side channel attacks. It's more about, you know, what can we do with side channel information or not necessarily side channel information, but just side information on an LW instance. And how does that help to, uh, to break uh, an LW instance in, in a very concrete sense? So we're trying to quantify very precisely uh, how it is. 
And this is joint work with uh, Dana Dachman Soled, Eugene Gong, and Melissa Ross. Okay, so here's a, here's a setup. We have those people, uh, they're side channel crypt analysts, and they have some fancy equipment. They do measurements on a chip. And from those measurements, they think very hard, they do some computation, and maybe they extract a secret key if they gathered enough uh, information from their measurements. And we have algorithmic crypt analysts. What they do is they look at the public key, they think very hard, do a lot of math, do a lot of computation, sometimes billions of years of computation, and then they recover the secret key, at least in principle. Um, so the question that motivated this work was the following. Let's assume that we have a side channel crypt analysis that mounted a physical attack on a scheme and that extracted some data, but despite all his effort, all his mathematics and all his computation is not able to recover the secret key out of it. On the other hand, we have the, um, the regular, the algorithmic crypt analysis, you know, that only looks at the public key and try to recover the key from it. The question is, can we recycle this information that was not sufficient for a direct side channel attack and feed it into the usual lattice attacks so that maybe we can decrease the cost of this, so that we need less computation to perform uh, this attack. Okay. And basically the question, the, what we're trying to do is to try to design a framework where it is very natural to start from an LW instance and to add extra information on it and see what happened on the lattice problems that we're dealing with. Um, and by doing so, we don't only uh, allow uh, attacks in the side channel scenario setting, we're also able to uh, use and exploit uh, information that could come from different sources. So for example, from active attacks, uh, like that's, that has been a, a topic of study, especially on these candidates. If you can trigger decryption failures, um, how, how does it help you? And very ad hoc analysis have been done of this. Um, I will also show that in some uh, specification of uh, schemes that are sought for the real world, uh, it is not exactly a textbook LWE. There will be some tweaks that uh, have been put there to maybe help this or that aspect of the scheme. And that maybe those things can be sought as extra information that can also be used to mount attacks. So here I'm mentioning, especially and true like and, and, and uh, round five uh, in, in other sense, but they've already been accounted for in Lizard and Entry Prime. There are also some tweaks that are naturally included in our framework. But I also want to mention that uh, while we do show in principle that there's some extra information, we do not at all you know, affect in any uh, non-negligible way the security of those schemes. It is merely food for thought on you know, what, uh, what aspect of the design can have an influence on the hardness of the underlying lattice problem. Um, so what does our framework look like? Well, let me first compare it to the standard methodology to uh, estimate the hardness of a crypto system, the resistance of a crypto system to lattice attack. So typically you start from a public key and then maybe you can view it directly as a bounded distance decoding instance. So BDD in a lattice lambda with a radius R. But sometimes for all the schemes, you might have to do a little bit of ad hoc massaging to really make the problem look like a BDD instance. And then there is a trick called the Canon embedding that kind of homogenize the instance to make it look like a unique SVP instance. And this is typically what we are going to feed to lattice reduction algorithms. Uh, so we propose to change a little bit this methodology and do as follow. So what we're going to do is to generalize uh, the bounded distance decoding problem to a distorted version of it. And this, this distortion that we include is gonna allow us to more naturally uh, adjust you know, the definition of the uh, formal problem to 
to kind of the real world instant that we're, we're faced with. So for example, here, we don't need to do the, the ad hoc tweaks. We can directly uh, see those public keys as uh, distorted DDD instances. But more importantly, this distorted version will allow us to include little by little extra hints on the uh, secret vectors that we're looking for, and that are going to modify the parameters of the bounded uh, decoding uh, instances. And then at some at the end, we're going to uh, do a, a step to transform it to a unique SVP and feed it to lattice reduction. And this is a very general way of doing it. It kind of systematize uh, both Scanan embedding and all the ad hoc tweaks uh, that we uh, were uh, that were mentioned just before uh, on this slide. Um, so the other contribution uh, of our work are, are as follows. So not only we provide a kind of a formal framework, but we also implemented, uh, you know, this framework in Sage, uh, in a way that can uh, that allows us to actually run those uh, attacks or to make predictions about those attacks. Um, on our way, we also propose a refined way of estimating uh, the precise cost of the primal lattice attack. Uh, so that applies a bit more generally than uh, the goal of this work. And the purpose of this is that uh, without this refined estimation, we would see a lot of variation between the predictions and the experimental results. So because we want to, to test our prediction, we, we really need to make our prediction account for all kind of phenomena that are considered negligible asymptotically, but uh, you know might matter for small dimension because this is in small dimension that we can actually run experiments. And other contribution are some kind of systematization of knowledge about all those uh, quirks that you have to do to mount a lattice attack against a particular scheme. So I'm not going to go into much detail there. Um, and to show that our framework is, you know, reasonably useful, we show three application example. And the first one is exactly in the line of the main goal of this work. Namely, we had a side channel attack for which the data was too weak uh, to be completed. Namely, the first uh, side channel attack of the paper of Boss et al. from 2018. And we show that indeed this information can tremendously decrease the hardness of the underlying lattice problem. Um, a second example are decryption failure, as I already mentioned. And here we're able to revisit the work of Danver et al. And the last example, which is really minor quantitatively, but interesting, at least uh, um, conceptually, are this, uh, this little detail in N2, lack and bound 5 that allows you to, uh, to that you can be that can be viewed as a hint within our framework. Okay, so a quick overview. So uh, first, I'm going to define more formally this distorted version of the bounded distance decoding problem, and explain how we estimate its concrete hardness. Uh, secondly, I'm going to uh, details uh, detail what kind of hints. Uh, are fit within our framework that can be integrated into distorted bounded distance decoding instances. I will quickly review our Sage implementation. And at last, I will enumerate very briefly uh, each of our application examples. So the, bonded dist the di distorted bounded distance decoding problem and its concrete hardness. Uh, so here are the formal definition. So the usual bounded distance decoding problem is a given a lattice and the target T, you have to find the unique secret uh, lattice point S that is close to T. And you have the promise that this point exists and that it is unique. Another way, more geometrical view uh, is to say, uh, you have to find the point that is in the intersection of a lattice and a ball centered at T and of radius R. And there is a unique search point. Well, the distorted bounded distance decoding version is simply a generalization of it where we replace balls by general ellipsoids. So we're going to have a lattice lambda and a mean or a center and a covariance sigma or essentially the shape of an ellipsoid. 
and we're going to have to find a unique uh, vector in lambda that you know is both in the ellipsoid and in the lattice. You can write this as using an ellipsoidal norm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but geometrically, it's just find this point in an intersection between the lattice and an ellipsoid. Um, a second simplification that you know we make along the paper is that we're not going to be very regarding about actual distributions. And somehow we're going to conflate all distribution of covariant sigma as being Gaussians of covariant sigma. So in particular, you can either think of the target of the, the problem, uh, you know, your LW problem as being uniform in an ellipsoid or Gaussian over uh, a certain covariance or maybe other weirder distributions. So we're, we're kind of making this, uh, this simplification. So it's not uh, entirely formal. Uh, so sorry, okay. Leo, one second. Um, so yes. the, the, there, are, there are no distributions, uh, just to understand again, there are no distributions in this problem. Uh, yes, yes. So sorry, the, the, there is no distribution in the problem, but you can wonder about how the instance was generated. In particular, mm -hmm. it's it's a problem with promise, mm -hmm. right? So kind of S minus T has been generated by someone who knows it. And, you know, you can ha either have chosen it uh, as a Gaussian or, um, or uh, as something else. And this is where the distribution is kind of uh, hidden one layer above uh, B BDD. It's more in LW, which then you view as a BDD. Mm. Okay, all right, nice. Uh, also, uh, Leo, you're giving a new name to this problem, but it seems to be just bounded distance decoding. But the, um, you could apply the transformation associated to sigma. You could apply it to lambda and mu, and just get a regular bounded distance decoding. That is exactly what I'm doing in the next slide. Uh, so the reason is that we do want to have this notion of a distorted variant of it is that um, if each time you have a distorted version, you, uh, you rotate your lattice, then the hints will also have to be distorted in this new basis to make sense. So we found it much more convenient to leave the ambient space unmodified and at least uh, while we're integrating all our hints, let me go back to this picture, uh, because the hints, they're kind of expressed in the original uh, basis of the space. If, if we were to, you know, renormalize our instance at each step, then it would be a mess to keep track of everything. So I found it more convenient uh, to yeah, no, I understand. Okay, I mean, notationally that's more convenient, but whether it deserves a new name, I mean, there are already so many lattice problems and then, uh, plus I think that DBDD may already have been used for the decisional bounded distance decoding. So it's... Um, I'm very anyway. sorry. Really... <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. But you know, I understand why it is more convenient to keep track of Sigma. I, I, I think you could just call it the BDD without changing the name of the problem. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, that's an interesting suggestion. Thank you. Okay. So as Daniele mentioned, um, it's, uh, we can always bring ourselves back to the case of balls. And this is something that we want to do because lattice reduction algorithm are typically designed for balls. I mean, it's kind of all equivalent, but it's nicer to renormalize everything to everything be a ball. So basically you take the inverse square root of your covariance matrix and you multiply all your inputs by it. And then you end up with an isotropic instance. Your lattice has been distorted, but now the covariance matrix is simply the identity and your problem is on the distance decoding problem. And here I even normalized it in terms of scaling so that the radius is always uh, square root of D as you can see here. I don't know if you see my mouse pointer. Do you? Yeah, I do. Okay. Okay, so, so we can uh, always convert it back to BDD instance. Uh, but, um, so the question is uh, on what does hardness uh, depends upon? And uh, this BDD instance in hardness is gonna grow with the dimension D and it's gonna decrease with the volume 
of the rescale lattice, volume of a lambda prime. And the volume of this rescale lattice is just the ratio between the volume of the original lattice divided by uh, the square root determinant of sigma. So what is nice is that if you want to um, keep track of only the hardness of the instance, you don't necessarily to keep you, you don't need to keep track of all the parameters of your lattice of, of your covariance matrix. All you need to keep track of is the volume of the lattice, its dimension, and the determinant of the matrix sigma. And that's going to be very nice for implementing fast predictions. Uh, so yes, I, I want to to remark that this rescaling is is certainly not new. It's more uh, you know, in a faulty systematization, and uh, you find it in uh, in ad hoc formal ways uh, for the cryptanalysis of Entrou or of Lizard, and uh, and you know it also nicely smooths out uh, this question, uh, one one technical question inside the Canans embedding uh, uh, technique. Okay, so now to hardness estimation. So we really did not want it to enter in the whole business of costing um, SVP calls themselves, because like everyone has his own model. So we settled to measure uh, hardness in this unit that we call the BIX, which is essentially the block size beta that is needed inside BKZ to uh, break the crypto system. And if you really want to convert it to good old bits of security, uh, a rule of thumb would be that three bits is about equal to one bit of security. And if you want to go in details about how to do this conversion, then you can choose about 20 different models from uh, this survey of uh, Martin Aldrecht and NR. Um, so how do you determine this better? Well, you take your parameters. So recall that uh, I've normalized the length, so the length does not appear anymore. Uh, it all depends on the volume of this new lattice and its dimension. And basically, uh, the, the beta to be chosen is the smallest beta that satisfies this inequality. And I'm not giving you the I'm not giving you the formula for delta beta. It doesn't exactly matter to, the, to, to this talk. I uh, just want to mention this methodology, and this is a kind of popular methodology of using the Gram-Schmidt assumption and then doing some kind of intersect argument on the Gram-Schmidt vectors to decide that the algorithm should win or not. This is not a very precise methodology, especially in small block sizes, and this is annoying for our experiment. So we kind of refined uh, this methodology and we used uh, the BKZ simulators. And instead of the uh, to replace the GSA, and instead of using an uh, intersect argument, we kind of made a probabilistic uh, analysis of when the algorithm should find the shortest factor, and this led to much more satisfactory results. So in black on this curve, you see what uh, this is the error the prediction makes um, when the experimental beta uh, is on the x-axis. And here on the y-axis, you see how much the prediction was wrong. And you see that the GSA intersect method, uh, it grossly uh, overestimates, it grossly underestimates the cost of at least attack for small block sizes, and then slightly overestimated for large block sizes. Whereas the probabilistic simulation model seems to give very accurate results in the all range. Again, this is only somewhat news because all the ideas that are behind this, you know, you can find them in the literature in different forms, especially enumeration with pruning. Um, okay, so let's go back to the central topic uh, of this work. Um, how do we formalize hints and how do we integrate them into the distorted version of uh, the bounded distance decoding? Um, so, there are four kinds of hints that we figured out uh, how we can integrate into uh, a lattice instance. Uh, the first one are perfect linear hints. So uh, you're given a vector V and you learn the inner product of uh, your secret vector S with the vector V. Uh, a second variant is when you learn the same thing, but only modulo and integer. And this integer might not necessarily be the, the modulus q of your LWE scheme. It might, for example, there are some interesting cases where um, this modulus is actually two, despite uh, the q of the scheme being a large 
odd number. Uh, you also have approximate hint, so it's kind of like uh, the first one, but this time you learn uh, the inner product up to a certain error. And the last kind of hint is, is a bit uh, weirder. It's not related to the secret, but only some information about the lattice. Uh, and I will explain um, it it's, uh, in our And those prediction, I will make some hidden assumption. You, you have to refer to the paper, but basically you have to assume that the hints are not redundant in some sense. And then this you can formalize as a notion of um, primitivity uh, of a vector in a lattice. So for this talk, because homogenization is always painful, I'm gonna assume that the hints are already homogeneous. That is for each of those hints, the value L is simply equal to zero. Okay, so how does it work out? Well, if we learn uh, an inner product S scalar V equals zero, how do we interpret this geometrically? Well, we learn that the secret lives in the space that is orthogonal to the vector V. So um, that's what no, we- Sorry, um, question. Um, yes. Actually, two questions about your previous slide. Um, yes. One, um, uh, you know, uh, there are reductions from uh, you know LWE to LWE with linear hens, right? Uh, are you saying that these reductions are sort of non-tight, so you have to analyze the problem with hens directly? Is that is that what you're saying? I suspect they're highly non-tight. Yes. Okay. Okay, that's one. I, I'm really not an expert. I've taken a look at this literature, and what appears to me is that, I mean, all those reduction they lose a logarithmic factor in the dimension of the lattice. And in terms of concrete security, that sounds huge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As we will see from, you know, the best attack I could design uh, with those hints, mm -hmm. you know, if you're given a single linear equation, the security decreased by three bits additively. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Second question is, uh, which, uh, can you remind me which lattice is lambda? Is that the, so the is that the kernel of uh, is that the LWE lattice or the uh, or the dual of it? It is the LWE lattice. I've I've actually not defined LWE, and I've just told you uh, we're directly working on BDD uh, because I thought I only had thirty minutes. Right. So so the, the I guess my confusion is uh, it's not clear what V has to do with the LWE secret, or rather V has to do with S. You know. Uh, so, so the V is, is a parameter of the hint. Uh -huh. So it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, you know, for example, if you mount a side channel attack and you're targeting the first coordinate of your secret, the vector V is simply going to be the vector one, zero, 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 zero. Right, but, uh, but I'm referring to your fourth bullet, uh, which says uh, short vector hints. I mean, so, mm -hmm. This is just a vector V in lambda with no relation to S, right? Uh, yes, I'm going to come to it later on, and you will okay. see its relevance. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to have one slide per for each of those. Okay. Uh, All right. Thanks. Um, okay. So back to this guy. So as I said, if we have the equation S V equals zero. We've just learned that the secret belongs to a hyperplane orthogonal to V. So what we can do is simply intersect the lattice with, uh, with the space orthogonal to V. And you have to change uh, the, the covariance matrix accordingly. You have to condition it on being on a hyperplane. And here's an explicit formula for that. So the effect on the hardness uh, is very positive because not only you've decreased the volume by uh, the dimension by one, but also you increases the volume of the lattice and increasing the volume makes the problem easier. And, uh, and you increase it by, by a factor that depends on the length of uh, the vector V. That's, uh, it's a bit subtle to, to, to figure this out, but if you do a two dimensional lattice Z2, you will quickly realize uh, that, that this is true, that when you intersect lattice, the, the volume of intersected lattice depends on uh, 
on the length of the vector defining the orthogonal of that span. Again, it's all under some primitivity condition that I'm not discussing here. Um, so now modular hints. Uh, so this time we only learn uh, this equation S scalar V is equal to zero mod K. Uh, and here we're still in luck because um, uh, the, the space of the space of all the points that have this, uh, that verify this uh, equality X scalar V equals zero mod K, that's still a lattice. And if we intersect to lattice, we still have a lattice. So again, we can easily um, import this information inside our lattice problem. And that essentially does not affect the covariance. It only increases the volume of the lattice by a factor K. And again, that makes it easier. So here, this effect on the covariance might, you know, there, you might lose a small epsilon in here. It kind of depends on the smoothness condition. And again, I'm going to uh, conveniently hide this under the rug and refer to the paper for it. Um, a third kind of hint, uh, our approximate hint. So this time we're learning that uh, S scalar V is equal to zero or more precisely that R scalar V is equal to E uh, for E an unknown uh, error. That, you know, for convenience, we're gonna assume to be Gaussian and of variant sigma square. I wrote sigma, but this should be sigma square here. And the nice things about Gaussian is that if you take a Gaussian distribution and take a measurement of it with a Gaussian error and look at the conditional distribution, then the result is still Gaussian, except that its covariance matrix has changed. And this is, again, the formula to compute the new covariance matrix. And here, again, you can convince yourself that this only makes the covariance matrix decrease, right? You're learning information. So you're narrowing down where your error lies. And finally, uh, short vectors in. So here, uh, the question is, I'm given uh, a vector that uh, lives in my lattice and it's short and what can I do with it? It's, it's not that I necessarily want to do it, but I'm just discussing what you, can, what you can do with it first. And what you can do with it is project the lattice orthogonally to this vector. It's projecting orthogonally, not intersecting orthogonally. And that makes quite a difference. Um, so in this case, the dimension is indeed going to decrease by one, but the volume is in fact going to increase. So this is a trade-off. This might or might not be a hint you want to integrate. So why are those hints important? They're here to formalize um, a, a trade-off that is already happening in the cryptanalysis of LWE. So in L, when, you're, when you're analyzing the hardness of LWE, sometimes you kind of have too much LWE equations. And it seems that lattice algorithms are better off by ignoring some of the LWE samples. And it turns out that if you interpret geometrically what ignoring uh, those LWE sample means, it precisely means projecting orthogonally to one of the canonical direction. And why is it meaningful to do this? Well, it is because you have Q vectors in, in the lattices underlying LW instances, because the vector Q000 and 0Q000, they're all vectors of the lattice, and they're somehow relatively short. They might be quite shorter than what you typically get if you just run LLL on a random lattice. So they're kind of useful information. Uh, so you might wonder, why do I need to abstract away this trick? Well, the thing is that if I start integrating other hints, I might make those Q vectors disappear. And then I need to find other vectors that would look alike. For example, vectors uh, with not one Q, but two Qs inside uh, this construction. Um, so uh, this is a, this is a, a nice abstraction of uh, an existing trick, but it's also a necessary generalization uh, 
uh, within uh, for for the goals that we're targeting. Okay, so we're all done with uh, the four kind of hints uh, that exist. So now let's uh, check that uh, what we what we predict is actually happening. So for this, we implemented a uh, whole framework in Python uh, and actually into with Sage. And we actually made three different implementation of the same uh, API. One that is kind of full-fledged and keep track of every, every information, the lattice, the covariance, is able to run the attack, but also to make prediction. And then we have faster version that are only able to do prediction or even uh, more restriction. Of it. And here's a code snippet. Uh, so in yellow, you have kind of the output of the interactive program. So you see that, uh, you know, with just a few line of codes, uh, you can, you know, start uh, seeing how hints uh, can affect an LBU instance. So now let's compare uh, the prediction versus experiments. And uh, thanks to our refined estimates, um, we we were able to, to have prediction that are actually very, very close to experiments, not only on the starting instances, but also as we keep increasing the number of hints we're putting in the instance. So here, uh, for each uh, for each example, we've run two kind of different dimensions. So that's why you see two curves, and each time the red curve is very close to the black curve. So I think that this looks pretty good. But if you look very closely, you see that there is kind of a small gap here. So it seems that there is, you know, uh, a minor phenomenon that we're fail with that we're failing to understand or failing to um, to fully capture. In, in our model, but I think that overall the prediction are pretty good. You're good, but not perfect. Okay, so we have a framework. It seems to make sound prediction. So now the last question is uh, how useful it is. And, uh, you know, when you see the kind of hints that I'm giving you in the framework and you're a side channel cryptanalyst, you might say, but come on, Leon, hints are never linear. And you're right, uh, typically you do not get linear hints, but maybe if you uh, are a bit creative, you can still extract some kind of linear information about something that is non-linear. And as my example zero, I will take the Hamming weight, which is kind of, uh, you know, power analysis 101. Uh, so let's assume that we have an LBV schemes and we know from the design of the scheme that the secret, uh, the secret coordinates are all uniform between minus five and five. And now I do my power analysis and I target the first coefficient in this power analysis and I learn that this Hamming weight is two. <clears throat> so if I combine this knowledge with prior knowledge on the secret, I can deduce that the first coordinate is either three or five, because in this range minus five, five, this is the only integer whose you know, computer representation has having weight two. And from there, you can deduce two hints. The first one is that the secret is odd. Okay, so you can write that is first component is congruent to one modulo two. And the second hint that you can say is that it is kind of close to four, okay? And more precisely that it is approximately equal to four up to a variance of, uh, up to an error of variance one. Okay, so this is still a toy example. I'm not saying that this is uh, realistic, but here I'm showing the principle that it's not because the leak is not linear is that you cannot extract some linear information. So a more substantial example that I'm not going to go into details, you have to go to the paper, uh, is a more realistic example where we took uh, one of the two single trace attack that was done by Borsetal and Frodochem. And out of those two attacks, there was two of them. There was a first one for which data was leaked, but the data was not powerful enough for key reconstruction. And then there was a second leak for which a full attack was uh, uh, possible. So uh, I, I really don't want to claim a new side channel attack. I'm really taking the first uh, failed attack as our perfect use case as an example, because this is the whole principle of our framework is to say, 
when a side channel attack fails, what can you still do with it? So this is why we choose this as our use case and not the, the more powerful side channel attack. And indeed, uh, we, we plugged uh, all this in our framework, designed the right hints, and we're able to see some significant decrease in security. For example, for the CCS2 parameter, we can go from uh, four, more than 400 bigs to about 100 bigs, uh, if you see here. You might notice here that I have like two different attacks. So the thing is that we formalize things using approximate hints, uh, but sometimes there's like the data is very precise and you know with 99% confidence that uh, this coordinate is exactly this value. And in that case, it might be better off to try to make a guess that has a one person failure probability and make you know maybe 50 such guesses so that your success probability is still of one half and you've integrated uh, perfect hints. And perfect hints are very good for, for making the, the problem easier. Um, quick remarks is that the approximate hints I've discussed in the talk are not exactly in the form that we use here. Here we need to directly give an a posterior distribution. And the second remark is that those numbers are not exactly definitive because we've been told that we're probably not using the data in an optimal way. So we're currently updating and see how far we can push this. Uh, my second example are decryption failures. Uh, so this was a topic that was studied a bit, uh, quite a bit, especially because of NIST candidate. And the question is, you know, in the, in the design of those NIST schemes, you might not want to make the failure probability extremely small or even equal to zero because that kind of affects the, the efficiency of your scheme. But the question is how, how much uh, uh, failure probability you can tolerate. And if the failure probability is, is too large, then you're somewhat susceptible to this kind of attack. Uh, basically, uh, the attacker kind of brute force through a random oracle some W and uh, he queries with this W inside the ciphertext noise, uh, decryption queries, and the decryption failure is going to be triggered whenever this uh, inequality happens. So S scalar W is greater than T. So uh, our first attempt to model this uh, using, uh, using uh, our, our hint formalism uh, was to say, well, uh, you know, when we've chosen W, uh, the, the distribution of, let's assume that S is kind of Gaussian. And because decryption failures are, are, uh, are very rare, it's been that, you know, this, uh, we are in the very, we are really in the tail of the Gaussian distribution for this inner product SW. And if we are in the tail of this distribution, the distribution decreases extremely fast. So actually knowing that SW uh, is greater than T is kind of like learning that SW is very close to T. And it turned out that this reasoning is kind of wrong because um, the hints are designed in the other way around. We first choose a W and then we kind of query a leak on W and then you know we'll, we'll, we'll learn something. Here's a, probabilistic experiment is different. We trigger, we, we, we randomize a lot of W until something happens with respect to S. And that makes this W not independent of S. So actually it carries much more information and you can analyze it that you can actually have a full dimensional hint. Actually all the directions of W tell you information about all the directions of S. So for each, uh, basically for each such W, you get not uh, one linear uh, approximate hint, but N such hints. And with this, uh, with this analysis, uh, we're able in a rather simple way of uh, reproducing some prediction that have been made by Danver et al. And, you know, I think that uh, this method is uh, significantly simpler that was uh, done in this uh, paper. So, We've not gained anything on the attack, but I think conceptually um, uh, the frameworks make it quite uh, clean, cleaner. And okay, the last uh, third example is 
quantitatively, it is kind of ridiculous. It is really marginal uh, what it does uh, on those schemes, but still conceptually, I think it's, it's cute. Uh, so on all those schemes in N2, LAC, and, and, and round five, uh, the, for, for you know, optimization of the practical design purposes, they've chosen the secret underlying uh, the LW instances to be ternary and have a fixed amount of minus ones and ones. And this you can write directly as a perfect hint, and that directly translates uh, into our framework. And here you need to be careful that it does not only affect the dimension of your lattice, it also affects its volume. In fact, it, this hint is going to increase the volume by a factor square root of d. And you know, some discussion of this kind of happened previously in the literature, but the effect on the volume might not have been uh, considered. So again, the practical impact is ridiculous. We lose maybe one bit of security on all those schemes. Uh, but it also triggered uh, some interesting discussion with John Shank, and in particular, uh, the attack of May and Silverman uh, on exploiting symmetry. So we're kind of uh, updating uh, our paper to include uh, more interesting discussions on, on this particular point. And that's pretty much it. I also want uh, to thank all the people we've interacted with, uh, you know, to make this happen. All the people that shared code or uh, gave us a nice uh, feedback or, or draft. Thank you very much. I will be happy to answer any question you might have. Thanks, Leo. Um, are there any questions? We have some time. Ah, okay, there is a question. You can read it, Leo, or you want me to read it for you? Uh, where can I read it? q and It's in the Q&A if you open it. Is it in correlation between contribution vector and description to do key recovery attack on real lack? I was wondering if you can use this type of data as hint as well. Uh, this is an interesting question and fair question. Actually, we've looked at the literature and there's like a dozen of potential uh, cases where our framework could be applied to clean up or improve existing work. Uh, we, we chose to limit ourselves to only three examples, but I obviously encourage you to, to try and see whether this can be helpful for cleaning up other works. Uh, Leo, I wanted to ask you, so uh, th this looks great, uh, nice talk, but um, so how much of this uh, um, is uh, just a sort of heuristic to estimate the security of those systems, or is there some part of it that could be uh, um, described uh, as an algorithmic result, you know, a theoretical result? Is there a way to extract uh, some type of uh, theorem uh, from this? Uh, I have no clue. I wouldn't know how to approach it, honestly. Uh, I think it would be great if, uh, because basically this is a work about upper bounds, right? It would be great if this approach could also lead to, to, to lower bounds. Um, I, I honestly have no, uh, no idea on the topic at the moment. So Leo, uh, just another question. You know, um, uh, you, you handle sort of leakage, linear leakage on the secret, LWE secret, right? How about the secret and the error, or, or maybe even just the error, you know? So, so oh, sorry, really there's been some confusion. What I call the secret here is all the secret data. So both uh, in the LWE, I'm, I'm right. assuming that all you're right. working with LWE in a short secret form. And what I call the secret is both the sides. Definition of, uh, you're thinking about the knapsack form of uh, LW. Yes. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So yeah, that's some more questions. Question. It's actually interesting. So one quick comment is that, uh, you know, um, if this actually comes, you know, leakages more than sort of linear actually come up in the, over the reels. They actually come up in, uh, in program obfuscation and they are actually quite fundamental in the, in the, in, the, in whether you, you know, you can prove security of these, you know, they, they, so let's say take the LWE secret concatenate error vector mm -hmm. and the leakage is a uh, degree two polynomial. So degree three polynomials on this. Uh, and now what happens is a, is, a, is, a, is a pretty important question. Maybe Rachel who is 
maybe here I can say more. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the framework we propose is really on the concrete side of things. So I'm not sure you can yeah. extract any asymptotic result on it. Maybe you can. Yeah. Um, I mean, in all cases, it would be pretty heuristic. Um, that might be sufficient. Uh, I don't know where the standards are uh, on this. Uh, actually, section. actually, even if you can break the the assumptions that these people make, uh, you know that uh, that's that's a concrete, uh, you know, a cryptanalysis question. You know, uh, anyway, I'll let other people ask questions. So Leo, maybe um, you can read out the questions because as, as they said yesterday, um, the, on the YouTube video, yeah, you will not see the questions. So if you could read the second question and just answer it or. Okay, so I will answer. So there's a question from Fernando who says that with a ratio of three bits to one bit, maybe we can actually break in practice the Frodo CCS2 parameters because it has only 100 bits of security after our analysis. So running BKZ with block size 110, that's, that's somewhat doable now. Uh, actually, the difficulty is not so much in BKZ, but just managing the very large matrix and just running the initial LLL on it. So it's kind of this weird state where we know it's computationally feasible, but we just, just don't have the software to manage this easily. Um, unless maybe uh, Paul Kirchner make uh, his uh, awesome parallel LLL uh, open source. Um, so now I have. Uh, can you say a bit more about the form of the photo chem leakage you, from which you significantly improve the attack? Uh, it may be a bit too technical. Uh, yeah, so, okay, maybe let me answer the question of Mehdi. Um, so, so the leakage that they give, what, what we try to use is the, the score table that they gave in their paper. And so we kind of look at the most, the best score and try to deduce information from there. Uh, but apparently this score table can be interpreted either as a likelihood table or as a posteriori table. And if we do this, we can improve the attack maybe a little bit further. So that's what we are working currently uh, on improving. Uh, and I think both, the, estim uh, the security evaluated by Bix seems very different from the result in the paper of estimate all the BLW and true schemes. What's the reason? I'm not sure this is the case for what I've checked. The prediction in terms of the block size are pretty similar. Um, maybe if you find some stuff that do not align, you can send me an email with uh, with the precise uh, um, with the, with the precise example where there is a big uh, a mismatch. Leo, one, uh, one more question. Yeah. Hi, this is Chris. Is it Chris? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. it is, hi. So um, it seems like it's pretty central to the approach in your framework that the secret or the, the BDD error be um, Gaussian distributed with some covariance. Um, can you say a little bit about how well that assumption translates or doesn't translate, or, or can you do something um, in a world where you know that the secret is more like, say, uniform over, you know, zero plus minus one or, or something uh, like that, where it's very much non-Gaussian? No, I, I mean, it's like... You know, distribution can be very weird and everything can go very wrong uh, if you designed, you know, special purpose counterexample. I don't think with the natural distribution that we see in the literature, uh, I don't think that this assumption is making a huge difference. But, you know, maybe some quirks could be useful. 
Um, so what would break down in the analysis uh, would be the formulas on how the covariance matrix evolved as you integrate hence. So if you try to do it for general distribution, then, then it just explodes to your face. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, there's just no way of efficiently representing even this, uh, this information on the computer. Um, so here it's kind of like, I'm, it's, it's frustrating, but I don't think we, this approach has much more to offer uh, on, on this particular point. You kind of have to assume that everything behaves kind of like a Gaussian and, uh, and live with it. Yeah, I guess, uh, thanks. And I guess the same answer for things where like the error is, is generated using rounding instead of random error, right? No, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I mean, I, I mean, for concrete design from rounding, we're really far away from the provable range. And I'm always tempted to believe that, uh, you know, something much more clever can be done, but I still not found what. Um, could this framework help? You know, maybe you can write some extra information as a hint. I don't know. I've, I've, I've tried and not been very successful, but sure, uh, keep, keep on trying. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the game. All right, thanks. So uh, maybe we can uh, take the rest of the questions offline. Um, uh, I'm sure Leo will be able to answer them. Uh, email offline. Um, uh, um, let's set up. Uh, maybe Catherine can set up her slides. Thanks, Leo. That was a great talk. Thank you.